It's great to be here. It's great to be at an in-person event. It's much better. I don't like Teams and I like Zoom. I dislike Zoom almost as much as I dislike Teams. I've, I've known Bill for 10 years. Bill and I developed a course on the history and philosophy of evidence-based healthcare. Um, and I think that empathy and values have a, have a natural relationship because values are important, but to elicit values, we need to have an empathic relationship. Um, I'm going to talk about can artificially intelligent care and chatbots be as good at empathy, which is related to Sabina's question. Well, it wouldn't be a an unempathic IT system. There we go. Which which button do I press to make it go? Forward? Discord and yeah. You can just use yeah, the arrows. So Outline, I'm going to talk about two NHS workforce challenges. Empathy is required, part of the solution. Um, why AI-driven driven care and chatbots, I guess they can't be empathic, or can they? A cause of a paradox, which I'll you know, illustrate, and escaping the paradox by changing the system. And by the way, at the end of this talk, I've got to run to a previous meeting. I tried to get out of it, but I couldn't for various reasons, but I'd be delighted to join the conversation Please feel free to share my email, and I'll be very sad to run away at the end, but I, I have to. Um, two NHS workforce challenges. We've all heard it before. Um, the mental health and physical health of NHS staff is low, and it causes absenteeism and presenteeism at a, a very high rate. And a main cause of this mental health illnesses. Um, this can be bad, not just for the practitioners, but for patients. It leads to patient safety problems. You've all read the Kirkup report, the Francis report, the Ockenden reports. They all name empathy. They use the word empathy as not the only cause of avoidable deaths, but as one of the causes. One of the causes. So why is empathy part of the solution? I mean, you see here again, Bob Barrett in the Times about six weeks ago said that um, there was a deep, deep-seated lack of empathy in the medical profession. He called for medical training to be redesigned to encourage a more empathetic and collaborative approach. The collaborative center is a good part of it. Doctors, I didn't intend to write that. I don't even know. So um, I've spent 20 years now investigating empathy using the similar tools we use to investigate the effects of drugs in the randomized trials and systematic reviews of randomized trials. I'm aware, of course, of all the, all the limitations of that kind of evidence, but I think rhetorically, rhetorically, if you want to change the move the dial, we have to speak the language of randomized trials and so on. And here's a bunch of stats. I'm going through fast, but if you can't understand me, please tell me to slow down. I mean, enhanced empathy, according to either large scale observational studies or randomized trials, increases patient satisfaction, reduces the amount of morphine post-operative patients need, improves cellular immunity, according to an observational study, reduces diabetic patient mortality, reduces chronic pain, increases patient Practitioner job satisfaction. I'll talk about that a bit more in a few minutes. Reduces practitioner burnout and increases patient adherence to medication, which itself is associated, as you know, with a number of positive outcomes. Lack of empathy can be harmful. Um, this is a story of a true story re reported in the BMJ. A 40 year old woman refused to see her GP because of lack of empathy and subsequently died of smoking related heart disease because the doctors always judged her. You're just smoking. Whatever you have is because you're smoking. She felt judged. They didn't talk to her about her values. And um, according to the authors of this paper, lack of empathy led to the early demise of this poor woman. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole trying to defend a definition of empathy, but this is a definition we are defending. We, we're actually developing this more empirically, but there is a growing consensus that in the healthcare setting, empathy requires understanding, Showing them being empathetic, being actually understanding, showing you understand, and some kind of helpful action. And this is taken from Stuart Mercer. A bit of the evidence of behind empathy. People say, I mean, um, I often give talks and they say, you go to the nurses, and they say, nurses say, empathy is our thing. We do this very well. You go speak to the GPs. Go talk to the GPs. We do this every day. It's those surgeons who've got to speak to. The surgeons, they say, oh, we don't care about empathy. We also just have to cut good. Mm -hmm. Just joking, of course, some of the most empathic 
practitioners that know are surgeons, including um, uh, people here. But but the the question, the fact is, we did a, a systematic review. I'm not going to go into any details. 64 studies. Empathy varies widely. Unsurprisingly, female practitioners are more empathetic than males on average. Spending longer with a patient leads to greater empathy. Um, Allied health professionals, on average, are more empathic than physicians. Then you say, okay, Jeremy, you established that it varies. So what? You can't teach it. Empathy is in your DNA. It's genetic. You know, <clears throat> you can't possibly teach so-and-so to be empathic. Again, not true. We did a, we found 26 randomized trials where they randomized practitioners or medical students to either receive empathy training or not, then measured their empathic behaviors downstream. And empathy changes behaviors. And you say, okay, so what? It changes the behaviors. They might look at you instead of the screen. Does it make a difference? We did a, a systematic review of randomized trials. Again, it does make a difference. A small difference, it must be said. I don't want to exaggerate it, but empathic care makes a small difference on average to some important patient outcomes, including reduced pain, improved quality of life, um, Reduce morphine use, et cetera. <clears throat> the trials look like this. You take healthcare practitioners, you train some, don't train others, um, and you get a statistically significant result. This is a subset of the trials. We found, we found 28 or seven, a subset. And there are 14 more coming up in a paper coming out in six days. Um, so you see here that the pain is low. These are patients with osteoarthritic pain. When treated by doctors, who are trained in empathy, their pain was lower every day for the follow-up period of 14 days. And that's, if you look at the effect of, if you look at drugs compared to placebo, morphine compared to placebo for pain, it's not much different. It's a small effect, but it's not much different than that, that effect size. There are, of course, limitations to the evidence, like all evidence. I'm not going to go into those, but you can't blind participants. If a practitioner is being randomized to receive more empathy, they know they're receiving more empathy. And you also have contamination. There are limitations. I was surprised to learn that I thought that I would take on the chin, okay, it has to be, it's good for patients, good for doctors. Um, no, it's good for patients, but it's gonna to lead to compassion fatigue, more burnout, that they're gonna be invested emotionally in their patients. It turns out just the opposite's true. There's a systematic review of 17 studies. There's a negative correlation, inverse correlation. The more empathic they are, the less burned out they are. Um, why? We don't know why, but I think this quote explains it. Victor Franklin said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. He was tortured, of course, in, in World War II. So I think that my hypothesis is that enhanced empathy, doctors are put in touch with why they're in the wonderful profession they're in. They can kind of connect more directly with the benefit they're giving the patient, and this creates more resilience. I'm not saying they should be therefore faced with the wonder, fantastic problems they face, but this is what seems to happen. Now, anecdotally, I hear stories. No, 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 this GP in our practice is the most empathic and they're burned out. I don't know why that is, because it contradicts the average evidence. So I have a hypothesis, which is not evidence-based. My hypothesis is that they'll take the most empathic GP, let's say it's Paquita in the practice, and they'll give her all the tough patients, all the hardest ones to deal with, complex, rude perhaps. And then Hakita might then experience compassion fatigue, not because of empathy, because she's getting the harder workload. That's a hypothesis to be, to be investigated. Um, empathy can also lead to reduced burnout at a leadership level. There's a, a growing literature, which is building on the fantastic work by Michael West on compassionate leadership, uh, something called empathic leadership, using the science we use to um, show empathy between practitioners and patients to, to, to increase that, apply that to leadership. I'm developing a model with a, an organizational psychiatrist to promote this further. So empathy can be part of the solution to this fantastic problem, but <clears throat> hey, all these problems also, right now the, I'm promoting empathy as a solution. The solution being proposed is more robots, more care bots. Can they be empathic as humans? What, what do you think the answer is to this question? To what extent do you think care box will replace human practitioners? Is it zero? Only humans can give medical care? A little bit, a lot, or 100%? Just have a number in your head. 
Anyone think it's zero? No one thinks it's zero. Does it? Anyone think it's 100? It's going to be like, no. We don't know the answer, but it's going to be somewhere. It, certainly, it's already somewhere in the middle, right? So it's happening, whether we like it or not. I happen not to like it, but it's happening. We have to accept, accept it. You know, Pepper can understand emotions, although the company making it withdrew from the market, I believe, because of lack of demand. Uh, this is a uh, row bear can pick up heavy patients. If you're tired, hard to pick up patients all the time, never gets tired unless they break down. Um, this one can make a drink and tell a joke and so on, make a gin tonic. Um, then there are cousins. We've all used these chat bots. I find them very annoying. Then they go, you know, look at a plane ticket or go to the bank and say, yeah. you know, talk to our assistant. It's not a person, and then they never answer the question you ask. And say, okay, then they just say, but then they, because they have the chat bot, they take away the humans, and then you're stuck with calling. So, but it might, it might get better. <laughs> we can, so they, 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 these things are here. Um, a philosophical interlude related to Sabina's question Is it important to be empathic or act empathic? Because if it's important to be empathic, you might say that by definition, robots cannot be empathic because they're robots. Um, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. What, when we teach empathy in Leicester, though, we, we teach because what's measurable is the behavior, not the being. We, so we teach them to be empathic behaviors. We also give our students vicarious experiences. For example, we're getting them to play wheelchair basketball against a professional wheelchair basketball team and do some drills. We hope this changes how they actually are. And it's easier to act empathic if you are empathic. Um, but we can't measure that. But again, leave that aside. And we wrote a paper with Jessica Moldy, who might be online now, and Luciano Floridi, who's now at Yale. Um, we said, let's skip that debate about being versus behavior. If you're going to talk about answering the question, can robots and care bots be as empathic as humans? You can never see you inside a human, and you can't see inside a robot. So we thought the important thing is a Turing type test for care bots and chat bots. Can human beings distinguish a difference in the empathy offered by care bots compared to the empathy offered by human beings? It turns out that when you compare them, as Sabina said, statistically, so far the evidence is nascent, so we can't make any definitive, draw any definitive conclusions. But so far, the robots are looking pretty good when you compare them with humans. And this seems like a paradox. We think, surely empathy cannot be offered by a robot. It's cold. No one, I think no one in the right mind would choose a robot over a human, but there's a, there's a cause of the pattern. The, the, reason, the reason robots and care bots are performing as well in terms of empathy as real humans is that we're treating human carers like robots. Um, we make them follow these quality outcomes framework, and I know that people criticize this, that there are problems with it, but we take it away, most recently, outcomes got worse. So it has to be a happy medium, it has to be a happy medium. If they're not, um, you know, doctors wasting two thirds of their time doing paperwork, it's a waste of time. I mean, the number of managers has gone up, the number of practitioners stay the same. Um, so this, we're treating humans like making humans fill out tick box exercises that robots are better at. They're not gonna get, they're not gonna make a two plus two error. Um, so is that. And this is causing poor satisfaction with care. One in three patients satisfied with, with care. So in, in those circumstances, it's not hard for robots. So here's a picture. Um, I used to do a sport called rolling. I'm 53 now, so I, and I don't train, but I used to be pretty good, but now I'm way past my prime. There are tens of thousands of people who could beat me at a 10K uh, rolling machine piece, tens of thousands. But I could beat Hussein Bolt on a 10K or even now. I could beat Chris Hel oh, what is this guy, Another, I forget his name. It's a show called Reach for these big, strong guys. I could beat Chris Helmsworth on some game. So if I force them to play my game, I can beat them. So that we're forcing humans to play the robot's game. So it shouldn't surprise us that humans are not, are not looking that, that good. So no one in the right mind can tell me that this can be replaced by a robot now, maybe in some imaginary future. It could be, but given the technology we have, it's unlikely that this scenario and others like it could be, you could take out the, the mother, presumably the mother in this case, and replace them with a robot, and the baby would feel as comforted. My, I've got a five month old, 
he knows my wife and he does like me as much. That's very clear. If I was a robot, I hope he would like me even less. He knows who his mom is, that's the bottom line. So robots can do some things better, but humans do some things better too. So how do we, to resolve this paradox, we have to have a manifesto to allow humans to do what humans do best and allow care bots and shepherds to do what they do best. Um, and when, when care bots replace humans, we must train them to be empathic, sure. But for this to happen, the system's got to change. <laughs> right now, we still, the way, the way medical systems are training, the way medical students are trained, they're treated like robots from the very beginning, memorizing facts. A lot of facts, getting stressed out, getting burned out and burned out, burned out, burned out when you use empathy. So they're, from the very beginning, and we're changing this at the Leicester Medical School. We have a transformative vision that involves transforming the medical school curriculum and doing system level empathy training. I can't go into details. Um, Paquita and I, Amir Gray, have written a paper about system empathy. This is just a, the figure from the paper. Don't bother with the text. It's just to show the group we're working on changing the system. And contrary to what's believed, it is possible to change the system. We have found, we've done pilot workshops in Canada and the UK. If you think you're too small to make a difference, try thinking with, with a mosquito. Um, here's another quote. One person can make a difference. In fact, it's not only possible for one person to make a difference, it is essential that one person makes a difference. And believe it or not, that person's you. I want to find another one because with the, the baby in my state of mind, I think about the five-month-old a lot. If you think you're too small to make a difference, Try spending 24 hours with a three month old. Yeah. They, they can't do anything. They could upset your whole life um, in a positive way, of course, but in a challenging positive way. Um, so, to summarize, NHS is facing major challenges, and empathy has been said to help solve both of them. AI driven care and chatbots are being offered as solutions. Paradoxically, these machines are beating humans at their own game to the detriment of patients and practitioners. The system of medical education, training, and delivery must change. Or the machines will continue beating humans at their own game. And it is possible to change the system. Thank you very much.